You know me, I talk about video games all the time, but I'm actually a big fan of non-electronic gaming as well. I've always been drawn to the sort of subtle brilliance of creating a game that doesn't require a computer to do all the calculations for you. Games where the prospect of chance was determined by an actual physical object instead of some unseen random number generator that just happens to give the computer player the exact role he needs right when he needs it. I love the classics, of course, like chess and backgammon, and also the more geeky stuff like Munchkin and Settlers of Catan. But without a doubt, the one game that I have spent the most time, energy, and money on is Magic the Gathering. Developed by Richard Garfield during his doctoral candidacy at Penn State, Magic was first released in August of 1993. While the idea of alternative games using non-standard cards was nothing new, Garfield and Wizards of the Coast literally owned the patent on the concept. And as the first game to do this... Holy shit, is it impressively complex. You play as a powerful wizard known as a planeswalker, and the object of the game is basically to kill your opponent. You each have 20 life, and your deck, which you can create yourself out of any set of cards you want, represents a pool of spells that you can cast, as well as other resources you can draw from. In order to cast spells, you must first play land cards, which provide colored resources or mana. Lands are essential to do anything in the game, and generally make up about one-third of the total cards in your deck. Once you have your lands in play, you can begin drawing resources from them in order to play cards. This can range anywhere from creatures which are used to attack the player as well as protect against your opponent's creatures, instants, interrupts, and sorceries which provide an immediate effect but are discarded after use, and enchantments and artifacts which remain in play and provide ongoing gameplay modifications like strengthening your creatures or drawing additional cards. Garfield understood the possible problems associated with letting people construct their own deck, so to prevent someone from simply stacking their entire deck with the most powerful cards, the game was designed so the more powerful cards required more mana in order to play, thus creating a risk-reward scenario and forcing the player to design their deck properly. If you had to wait until several turns into the game to get your ultra-powerful creatures out, by the time you were able to do so, your opponent will have already likely killed you with his cheaper attacks and spells. The complexity of this game is legendary, and players can often get into arguments about exactly how certain cards interact with each other, especially when there are certain abilities that can be activated in response to somebody else doing something, changing around targets of effects, or even outright causing their entire plan to backfire. But the complex nature of the game is what makes it so addictive and deep. There are an almost infinite number of combinations you can use to build your deck, so it's very rare that you'll ever play against two decks that are exactly alike, unless of course they were designed that way. Now, a small word of warning. If you're not familiar with the game of Magic, a few of the terms and references I'm going to make are just going to fly right over your head. So whenever that happens, I'm going to have Commander Odo pop up just to keep things interesting for everybody. I first heard about this game when I was in fifth grade, and my brother and I started playing it that summer. We only had one deck we had to share, which we both drew from, and it was pure black, so abilities like Swamp Walk were extremely broken. We didn't even have enough land, so we actually used playing cards as proxies. So what if it wasn't tournament legal? It was something we were both interested in, and it gave us something to share. Once we started building our own decks, I tended to focus on blue, the color of intellect and cunning, and my brother liked red, the color representing chaos and destruction. For me, Magic was an exclusive club that only myself and a few of my closest friends knew about. It was fun, it was challenging, it was engaging, it was always different every time we played. We would constantly be retooling our decks to make them more streamlined, reading magazine guides for new strategies, and checking prices to see how much our collection was worth. I would try to share my passion with others, but unfortunately, I went to school with morons. They were too busy listening to Wu-Tang Clan and talking about Dennis Rodman to appreciate the nuances of a game like this. They would even steal my cards, not because they wanted them or they thought they were valuable, no, they just knew I liked them. Fortunately for me, there was one way to play the game where I didn't have to worry about the horrors of social interaction. In 1997, Microprose released the first official version of Magic for the PC. By graphical standards, it's really not too impressive, but we're talking about a card game here, what do you want? All the cards are represented using the same artwork from the original game, and clicking on a card will show it in the sidebar so you can read the text. All the modes you'd expect to see in a game like this are here. There's the Deck Builder, which contains almost 800 of the most popular and useful cards, including cards from the first four expansions, ready to be used in any deck you want. Once you build your deck, there was Quick Battle, which pitted you against any other deck in the game using the deck of your choice, and there was Tournament Mode, where you would get a set number of booster packs and had to build the best deck possible out of them to compete against a series of opponents. But I rarely played these modes. No, the one thing that kept me coming back to the PC game was the Adventure Mode, Chandelar. Chandelar is essentially a full-fledged RPG, complete with gold, food, exploration, treasure, and random battles. 
The difference being instead of fighting enemies in the traditional RPG sense, you fight them using your magic deck. Since it's based on classic magic, it uses anti, and this is one way of getting cards to build up your deck. The other way is being finding them in shrines or buying them from merchants in town. It really makes you feel like you're accomplishing something when you play it. You start off with a small deck of one of five colors, but as you play and collect more cards, you can choose to expand it. You can add more cards, remove others, streamline land or mana sources, and switch between three active decks at any time. Every time I start a new character, it reminds me of when I just started out playing the game and choosing among my limited selection of cards which one would be the best for the deck. There were other cards out there that were better, but if you didn't have them, you couldn't use them. It forced you to actually strategize and experiment with cards you wouldn't ordinarily touch. You couldn't just build any deck you wanted right away, and that's what made the game so great. If you wanted really powerful cards like the Moxes or Ball Lightning or Demonic Tutor, you had to work for it. You had to hope you got lucky fighting against a powerful enemy or trade away your hard-earned treasure for them. One of the most memorable aspects of the game was the fact that the developers knew they had a computer functioning behind the scenes, so they added cards that were actually exclusive to the PC game, complete with custom artwork. Many of these cards deal with random chance, like the Gem Bazaar that changes its monotype to a random color every time you use it, the Goblin Polka Band which has its own musical cue that plays, and perhaps the most batshit insane of all, Whimsy, which simply says, play X random fast effects. Just think about that for a second. Any effect that any card in the game is capable of doing is instantly played on a random target. Let's try casting it now with X equal to 21. Okay, so he gets the effect from Sinbad, so he draws a card. It's not a land, so he has to discard it. Sinbad again. Disrupting Scepter on me, so I have to discard a card. Then Disrupting Scepter again. He casts Crumble on my Tetravite. Then, okay, never draws Disc, so pretty much wipes everything from the board. Uh, Sinbad on me again. It's a land, so I get to keep it. Healing Solve on me. Fissure on my Ursus Power Plant, so that's gone. Uh, healing Solve on my opponent, Healing Solve on me. Fissure on my Ursus Mine. Twiddle taps my Volcanic Island, which was already tapped. Time Elemental effect on my Ursus Tower to my hand. Ancestral Recall on him, so he draws three cards. And top it off with Ancestral Recall again. So now he has 15 cards in his hand and nothing in play. Now, no game is flawless, and Chandler has its share of strange bugs and gameplay quirks. For example, you can essentially break the game if you have two Time Bolts in play. With Time Bolt, you can choose to skip your turn in order to take two turns in a row later. But if you have two in play, you can skip a single turn to charge both of them. That way you have a total of three free turns in a row. Use one and skip the other to charge both Time Bolts again. Congratulations, your opponent never gets a turn. Also, since the game is heavily luck-based due to how your deck is ordered, there are times when you will lose in the middle of a dungeon simply because you didn't get enough land. Something we in the community affectionately call Mana Screw. Which isn't so much a bug with the game, but an unfortunate side effect of any luck-based strategy game. This happens even in the physical tabletop version, perhaps even more so due to the inefficiency of manual shuffling, so I can't really fault the game for that. However, there are times when you won't quite lose, but end up defeating the enemy with only like two health left. Certain enemies will actually be impressed with how well you did and decide to reward you by having your life total carry over into the next duel. Gee, thanks a lot, asshole. This happens automatically when you're in a dungeon, which can fortunately result in grossly unbalancing the game in your favor. In a case like this, a simple white life gainer deck can let you completely sweep the dungeon, as you will actually end up with more life every time you get into battle. But despite its minor flaws, Chandelar is a spectacular PC version of Magic. It contained everything we could have wanted in a digital port of the card game, taking the concepts stored in the tabletop version and adding features you could only do with a computer. There are tons of other officially licensed Magic the Gathering games to come out for the PC and the console, and you'd think with such an amazing debut, things would only get better from there. Well, let's take a look at some of the other games to come out in the Magic the Gathering franchise. Magic the Gathering Battle Mage for the PlayStation was the first experiment in bringing Magic to a home console. Consoles were still not quite powerful enough to compete with PCs, so it's natural to expect that they would make a few minor tweaks just to be able to fit everything in. Battle Mage accomplished this by turning the turn-based strategic gameplay of the card game into a real-time strategy. Wait, what? So let me get this straight. You took a game that needed a little more than a mouse, then turned it into something that required frantic planning, specific unit control, and fast reflexes, and then made you play it with a fucking PlayStation controller? And guess what? It didn't work out too well. The controls in this game are absolutely crippled. 
The shoulder buttons act as shift keys to allow you to open your hands, scroll the screen, and move between areas on the battlefield, but the context for these buttons changes depending on what you're doing at any particular time. If your hand is open, the square button will expand the card's information box with a full description, and then to close it, instead of just pressing square again to toggle it, you have to press circle, and then R2 to get back to the battlefield to give your unit's orders. By the time you've turned your controller upside down and inside out to do this, you've already had a quarter of your health taken off by one of your opponent's creatures. Giant also, take a look at this screen. Notice anything missing? How about a mini-map that lets you know where your opponent is in relation to you? Or for that matter, where your own units are? Sure, you can snap the camera between yourself and your opponent, but if you're trying to intercept one of their creatures en route, you have to scroll the screen manually. So good luck trying to find one and select it in time to actually cast your spell before it hits you. This is played on a difficulty of zero, and it's still fucking impossible. You have to be an absolute magic god to get anywhere in this game. I consider myself fairly knowledgeable about this game, I've been playing it for 15 years, but you have to know exactly what every card is by sight, how much it costs, when to play it, and then you have the added difficulty of doing it in real time, watching the field to make sure none of your opponent's creatures are sneaking up on you, and then commanding it to attack your opponent, which, by the way, you have to select manually instead of making that the default command. Who the fuck do you think I want you to attack? Before you even get into the game, the interface menu is completely unintelligible. Look at these symbols. Do you have any idea what these things do? What's that symbol? What's that? What's that one? Oh, that thing has numbers on it. It's almost like they designed this to be played with a mouse, but asshole, this is a fucking PlayStation game! The real tragedy is that you can almost see a good game under this. Aesthetically speaking, I would never call it rushed or lazy. They have voice clips for every spell you can cast. Lightning Ball. Monsters, Goblin Raiders. Ornithopter. And even sprites for every artifact you can summon. You could tell they put a lot of effort into it, but somehow that makes it even worse. If it were rushed, you could assume they just didn't have time to test things out, and we were the unfortunate guinea pigs in some sick experiment. But when you have a game with this much attention to detail, you have to assume they were pleased with everything else as well. Yeah, the developers wanted the opponent's AI to be fucking impossible. They wanted the controls to be unresponsive and clunky. This was the game they playtested and said, Oh yeah, publish this. Battle Mage is one of those games where footage does not do it justice. The only way to know how balls clinchingly irritating this game is, is to play it for yourself. But that would mean actually devoting energy towards finding a copy of it, and I can't in good conscience consider this to be a worthy use of your time. This is not even an enjoyable bad like Duke Nukem Forever or E.T. This game is simply unplayable. Adding on to the original Microprose game, a group of fans created a mod called Monolink so you could play the game online and kept adding new cards to it until Wizards of the Coast released an official update of the game in 2002 called Magic the Gathering Online. Unfortunately, I pretty much stopped even the tabletop game after high school because I was busy with other things. But from what I understand, the game is fairly faithful to the physical version, allowing players to buy virtual booster packs, create decks in the editor, compete in online tournaments for an entry fee, and play against people all over the world. They could even redeem their virtual cards for physical ones, for an additional fee. Of course, this type of microtransaction-fueled economy isn't everybody's cup of tea, so what if you wanted to get into Magic with a whole slew of new cards, a tutorial system, and online play, all for a single flat rate? Well, then you must have been the target market when Wizards of the Coast released Duels of the Planeswalkers in 2009. And I just want to say, from the bottom of my heart, I fucking hate this game! First off, Duels of the Planeswalkers was already the name of the second expansion to the original Microprose game, so immediately there's an element of confusion there. I will never understand why so many brain-dead executives insist on giving games the exact same name as a game that came out years before. Is it really that hard to use a fucking subtitle? Prince of Persia and the Temple of Araman, Twisted Metal Legacy, Sonic the Hedgehog Bestiality Simulator 2006, Capcom may have re-released the exact same Street Fighter game every year, but at least they bothered thinking up a new name each time, or at least a prefix or suffix or whatever. Anyway, Duels of the Planeswalkers marked Magic's triumphant return to the console. After a Japan-only Dreamcast game and a lackluster Xbox edition, Magic was back and ready to introduce an entire new legion of fans to the awesomeness of the strategy card game. Or so I thought. For what it's worth, the graphics are as good as you would hope for a game like this. Combat is visceral and nicely chunky, with satisfying sound effects when you deal damage to your opponent or destroy their creatures. It pretty much caters directly to your primal instinct to destroy. Which is exactly the fucking problem. This entire game is nothing but a wholly dumbed-down version of the original Microprose game, except with flashier graphics for the sole purpose of mass consumption. 
How can a methodical card game compete to earn the money of frat boys who only play Madden and Call of Duty? With explosions and lens flare and particle effects! Boom! It's awesome! Well, here's a good sign. Let's start off the game with a commercial for the game you're already playing. There's something about this that makes me sick just looking at it. Beyond the overall concept, there's lots of minor things that just feel like bad ideas. I don't know what kind of music I'd imagine when I play Magic, but it's certainly not Indian riffs with funk guitar backing. Or here, where I'm asked to choose a land out of my single color deck. Uh, duh, which one should I pick? They're all so different and versatile. Or being forced to wait for your opponent when there's nothing they can do. Bitch, what are you waiting for? You're tapped out! The producers decided to focus this time on the actual card game duels themselves. The campaign mode is nothing more than a slog through every other planeswalker with a minor narrative thrown in between duels. As you progress further in the game, you unlock more decks that can be used in online multiplayer. There's no save console combat, which, yeah, okay, how would you even do that? But they do have a co-op mode called Two-Headed Giant. You may not think this game seems all that bad, but trust me, this version may look ten times more attractive, but it's also a hundred times more brain dead. Answer me this, what is the number one primary attraction to trading card games? If you said designing and building your own deck, congratulations, you just discovered the critical flaw with this piece of shit. Let's look back at the Microprose Pros game for a second. This is your deck editor, 800 some cards at your fingertips, an infinite supply of land, everything sorted by color, type, and expansion. Any kind of deck you could possibly want to build is right there, ready for you to play with it. There's even a stats page that lets you list your mana sources by color, so you know how many cards you need to add or remove in order to balance it. The deck editor in the new version, on the other hand, looks like this. When I first saw this, I was in denial. I refused to believe that this was the extent of the deck editor. I couldn't. I was sure that somewhere, buried deep within the menus, or once you got out of the tutorial, there would be some way to actually edit your deck in the deck editor. But no, I was wrong. Like Sonic's jump button, that's all there was to it. The entirety of the so-called deck editor boils down to this. You're given your pre-made deck and 17 specifically chosen extra cards. Which of them would you like to add to your deck? You don't even choose to replace other cards that are already in your deck. No, no, that would require some sort of planning and thought, and goodness knows we can't have that in the game we want to actually sell, right? This whole thing feels like a blatant cash grab. If you don't want to spend the time playing against every opponent to unlock the 17 oh-so-special cards in your deck, you can use one of your deck keys, which costs real-world currency, to buy. The cards can be unlocked just by playing the game, but isn't that a smart use of your money, paying so you don't have to play the game you paid for? And even if you're not interested in that, they give you the option of spending a key to trick out your whole non-existent virtual deck with hollow foils. Yes, they are literally trying to impress you with shiny things. What kind of person would spend real money just to make their cards shiny in order to impress people they play against? All of the strategy is gone. You play your deck, deal your damage, cast your spells, and brag to your friends about how badass you are. Interrupts and the effect stack are gone because, oh no, people found it hard to understand. Now, I realize the rules for this game are based off of the major rules change that happened in 10th edition, which is exactly the problem. I fucking hated 10th edition. And this game is the end result of Wizards' attempts at making a game more accessible while simultaneously making it stupider. Now, maybe you're thinking I'm reading too much into this, I'm comparing it too much to the old game, and I should just shut the fuck up and try to enjoy the game for what it is. A turn-based strategy combat simulator with unique rules and gameplay style. Who cares if you can't fully edit your deck? In StarCraft, you're only allowed to choose between three different factions, does that make it a bad game? No, and I probably wouldn't mind having such a limited selection of decks to choose from if the decks were any fucking good. All of these decks lack any sort of complexity or nuance. It's like a fighting game where every character is Ryu. There are no advanced tactics to employ, no reward for working to master a harder to use but more powerful deck. Since pretty much every deck is balanced against the others, it means luck becomes an even greater factor in the game. This is just speaking from my personal experience, but I have never in this game, ever, not once, ever beaten another opponent due to skill, strategy, or tactics. Every time I won, or lost, was because one player didn't get enough mana early in the game, or didn't get enough spells. Every. Single. Time. You might as well sit at a table flipping a coin for as much strategy actually matters in this game. This game isn't bad. Battle Mage was bad. This game is insulting. 
I am insulted that Wizards of the Coast thought this is what we wanted Magic to be. The biggest letdown here is not the fact that my favorite game has been taken from me and given away to the same plebeians who stole my cards in middle school. That's just a personal vendetta, and I can look past that. The shameful truth is that people are accepting this game as great, when it could have been so much better. Chandelar proved that you don't have to adhere strictly to the rules of the original game. You can merge traditional gameplay and video game concepts to create something wholly unique and memorable. Sure, if you take too many liberties, things become... unrecognizable. But there is so much wasted potential in this game, it just makes me sick. The developers took no chances here. This is like creating a billion dollar real-time physics engine for the sole purpose of watching cars explode. Pretty much every year afterward, Wizards released a new installment of Magic, changing cars as the core set was modified and the rules changed, but I never bothered with any of these. Ironically enough, they did finally give players a full deck editor in sealed tournaments in the 2014 version, but I couldn't care less. The 2009 version just ruined it for me, and I really haven't touched the game since, digital or physical. This was the game that made me realize that Magic was dead to me. It may have been more popular than ever, but it was not the same game I fell in love with, and I would never be able to relive those days from my childhood. I still play Chandelar occasionally from time to time, but these cards have absolutely no sentimental value to me anymore. I suppose that's a side effect of loving something with such a long history. It grows up, but so do you, and eventually, you just grow apart.